what was it like to work with Kid Rock on Bad Boys? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Beyond the Lens, presented by Diesel Films. I am Seth Shapiro. And I'm AJ Speaks. Hailing out of Woodstock, New York, Zach Levitt's love of basketball landed him a job in the Miami Heat video room right next to future Hall of Famer Eric Spolstra. Levitt then took his love of sports and storytelling to NBA Entertainment, where long nights in the edit bay led him to become their lead director on some of their most formidable documentaries. Including the highly anticipated 20-year anniversary documentary on the Dream Team. Zach tells us what it was like to work with 11 Hall of Famers to share their memories on the 1992 Olympic experience in Barcelona. We then transitioned to a documentary that I truly enjoyed on Julius the Dr. Irving. This was more than just a biopic piece. Zach was able to get the doctor to open up about so much more than just basketball. And lastly, we touch on Zach's highly acclaimed 30 for 30 bad boys on the Detroit Pistons late 80s, early 90s teams. You won't want to miss a moment of the conversation on this episode of Beyond the Lens presented by Diesel Films. 29 years ago, the Dream Team graced us with their presence at the 1992 Olympics. Man, almost 30 years ago. And who better to chat with than the director of the Dream Team documentary, among many other great NBA docs, Zach Levitt. Zach, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me, guys. I'm excited to talk about it. Oh, you have a lot of stuff to your work. Uh, so, Zach, we're going to get into all of it. So, we'll get it started. Let's do it. So, Zach, we like to break the podcast into three acts, and the first act is your story. Where did you grow up, and where did your love of sports and storytelling intersect? I grew up in Woodstock, New York, upstate New York, a small country town, no stoplights, and I grew up playing baseball, baseball and sandlot football. Those were my two sports, uh, really because they were really the only two sports I had access to. There was a broken down basketball court in town that nobody at that time really played. And so we would play sandlot football and you'd see broken arms and (laughs) dislocated fingers. And I slowly got uh, really interested in basketball as I got older. I happened to be five foot three in 11th grade. Now I'm just about six two. So I shot up late. So basketball was never really an option for me, although I played every day and began to love the sport probably around 14 years old when the Knicks, you know, really started to get busy in the Eastern Conference and developed a crazy rivalry, of course, with the Chicago Bulls. Love Michael Jordan, but also hated him because he beat my Knicks every year. So coming from a small town, my father lived in Florida. Parents got divorced when I was very young. I had a choice between a Florida school, a Florida college, or New York. And of course, I made the obvious choice to go to the, the fun in the sun. Went to Florida State University and and was actually pre-med until my senior year. Growing up, I always uh, either wanted to be a doctor or actually an actor, but I didn't have the guts to pursue acting to really like, you know, take that risk. My family was, I think, was very risk averse, you know, go with a profession that's safe, etc. I got to college and by my junior year, I took organic chemistry and I said, I don't think I want to be a doctor and changed it all around and ended up going to graduate school in Miami for sports management at a small school called St. Thomas University, which at the time was one of only a few schools that offered a master's program in sports management. But I was always so interested in film and it was funny, like for Some of the projects that we had to do in graduate school, they had to be sports-based. How would you start a franchise? Those types of things. What would you do? Create a business plan for a franchise. And I remember my business plan was about a movie-themed restaurant. (laughs) So I I was totally moving away from sort of the sports business piece and more towards the film piece. I had no idea how to really engage with film. I, I loved film. I didn't really know where to start, you know, as far as making films, right? How do you do that? How do you get your first step? At the time, there was an opportunity to take a job in the Heat video room, the Miami Heat video room. They, they had come on the first day of graduate school, along with front office members of every franchise and sport you could imagine, both on the collegiate level and the professional level. They had come to St. Thomas to solicit interns. And I said, hey, let me try to work for the Heat. You know, I love basketball. Even though I love the Knicks, I'll give it a shot. 
and I ended up being asked if I would do game day, take uh, stats on game days in the video room for their video coordinator, who was a person named Eric Spolstra, the second most tenured NBA coach right now for the Miami Heat. An amazing person, amazing coach, amazing at all levels. And I worked for him that whole season taking stats with a pencil on a yellow legal pad for for Pat Riley. Shots contested. It was Riley's first year, I think, that year as well. I got to pause you for a second. He let you use yellow because everything's blue. (laughs) They either couldn't afford blue at the time. (laughs) It was only for the coach. Actually, I do remember, you know, Spo would walk around with the blue paper in his back pocket like the coach at the time. Um, but yeah, we had we had the legal pads and, and literally we would draw like a like a semicircle for the three point line. And each shot was a line. And if the shot was contested, we would put the line in a circle. <laughs> and then I would give that to Spo at the end of the game. It was an amazing experience, both, you know, working for him. I lived, lived right next to him. We became friends. And working for the Heat at that time when they were transferring to the Riley era was amazing. And then the next year, I was a full-time intern for the Heat, you know, being the guy holding the, the, the big foam hands on the court during timeouts, like trying to block people's shots and stuff like that. <laughs> Yeah, that was right at the height of the incredible rivalry with the Knicks. And I'll never forget, I was standing right on the baseline when that major fight broke out between P.J. Brown and Charlie Ward. And I was just an intern and I was standing there trying to help break it up with the security guards. And I I was a Knicks fan. And you were on the court for that. Walk me through that moment. How did you end up on the court? What, What happened? I think I was waiting at the corner, you know, when it would be close to when there would be the TV timeouts, you know, the interns were always helping the encore performers get out there, get their equipment out there. And I I can't remember what we were about to do during that timeout, but it was right before timeout. So I was standing right in that corner waiting to go out onto the court. And sure enough, right in that corner, I can't remember if Charlie Ward fouled PJ Brown or, or the other way around, but it was a really hard foul and they got tangled up and it just became a brawl. And I was standing right there and all of the security guards came sprinting over to try to keep the fans out of it, of course, and break it up. And I was standing right there. You can probably see me in the video, like reaching in, trying to pull people apart. The intensity at that time was insane. I think the next year was the LJ Alonzo morning fight, right? Where Jeff Van Gundy got caught in the middle holding on to onto Zoe's leg. Yeah, the rivalry in the East at that time, it was physical and, and fierce. So walk me back for a second. Who was that teacher or person of influence for you that sort of took you from the video room into, hey, I want to do this for a profession? That didn't happen yet at this time. So when graduate school was finished, I wanted to move back to New York. I wanted to live in Manhattan and still incredibly interested in film. And I thought, how could I parlay my experience in sports and with the heat in particular and film? So I reached out to uh, NBA Entertainment and Spo actually told me the trick that when he was applying for the video for the video coordinator job, he sent a letter a day every day, you know, talking all the teams, right? He sent it to every team, right? Well, I I think he also sent it to I want to say Dave Wall at the time was the GM with the Uh Heat. Yeah, he did send a letter to every team, I think. But I want to say he sent a letter every day to the Heat. Anyway, I did that. I, I sent a letter every day to the person who was doing the hiring at NBA Entertainment. And when I finally got him on the phone, I apologized if I was being annoying. And I remember he he used the word precipice. He said, you're right on the precipice of being (laughs) very annoying, but being, you know, being also industrious, right? And so anyway, they hired me. The combination of the two things that I loved the most in the world at that time was basketball and filmmaking. I didn't know anything about filmmaking at the time. And I just put in an insane amount of hours starting at the bottom, logging games, understanding what shots were being used in features that were being done at the time. You know, we had the partnership with NBC. So the division that I was aligned with was the specials and home video department, right? So we were doing all sort of the, I guess you could say high profile production at the time. And I wanted to be an editor and I finally got my shot. And that's where I really put in the the minimally 10,000 hours of, of editing. And I feel like that's where I realized not only can I be pretty good at this, but I love it. I love editing. And that's really where I began cutting my teeth ultimately as a filmmaker. 
is I think it's so important to learn the aspect and the technique of editing and spend time doing that. Because when you're in the edit room, obviously, you're saying to yourself, oh, shit, I wish I had a shot of this. Or I wish the, the producer would have covered it this way or gotten this angle. When you become that producer and you're out in the field with a player or with you know whomever your subject is, you have no excuses, right? You're creating your own story. And so when you get back in the edit room, if you don't have those shots, you only have yourself to blame. So I learned that very quickly and sort of worked my way up, realized that I also had a knack for connecting with players, with athletes and being out in the field and developing relationships with those guys. You know, taking that in parallel, honing my craft as far as storytelling. You know, but to answer your question, when you started, you said, who was it that took me under their wing? There was a guy there by the name of Jim Potteritz. I don't know if you guys have talked to him yet. Uh, no. Pod. He directed uh, the Lakers Celtics 30 for 30 Best of Enemies. He also produced Survive in Advance. He does a lot of work with John Hawk. He was running the division at the time, and he was a guy that would pull all-nighters constantly. I would come in at 8 or 9 in the morning, and he would be passed out of sleep in his edit room. You know, that was like a badge of honor. And then all of a sudden, I was the one that was doing those things that was pulling these all-nighters, and I just loved it. I loved everything about creating these stories and, and figuring out how to do it in the most effective way. What would you say was your big break from going from – like a PA and an editor who's cutting highlights to now doing features to now doing long form content. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of space in between, you know, starting to do these features and then, or, or starting to do, you know, the short features into docs. And those steps were running my own shows, higher profile shows. I think ultimately one of the bigger ones was I ran a show called the association which ESPN Films aired the first year. We followed the Lakers for a whole year and turned that into a one-hour special. And then the next year we did six episodes on the Celtics and then the Brooklyn Nets. So I, I ran all of those shows, but right around the time of the association with the Lakers was the impetus of 30 for 30, right? So so they had come to the NBA and said, you know, what what do you have to offer basically? What show, what what films would you want to do? And and I remember there were there were two that were being kicked around. One was the Dream Team, which we ultimately did for NBA TV. And then the other was was uh, Once Brothers. So really getting on that film with Mike Talasian as a producer and an editor and a shooter was the first real film that I really had sort of an ownership stake in, in the sense that, you know, I was actually helping to put it together with Mike. I mean, it was all, you know, it was Mike's baby. He wrote and directed it took me on as a producer. We went to Croatia and Serbia. And that was the first taste that I had gotten of making a film. We did, I, th I think, a, a good job on that film. People really liked it. Based on the success of that, when ESPN came back to us, I, I think I was the natural choice to produce and direct these films and, and NBA TV. I think the dream team was the next one. Yeah. We'll get into that here shortly. But I wanted to ask you, when you do produce, because we're going to ask you about once Brothers, what is the difference for our listeners when you're producing and when you're directing? What is the role of the producer? On, what was your role on Once Brothers? It's actually funny because in the traditional sense, a producer is sort of smoothing things out for the director. I, I think that's probably, the, for me, the easiest way to distill that into, into something sort of easy to understand. That person is, if for a documentary, maybe reaching out to potential interviewees and forming a relationship with them, gaining their trust so that they will tell the story and then the director will step in and, and do the interviews. That's the traditional sort of producer role in a doc, right? Helping the director out, forming these relationships, working on locations, that kind of thing. For my experience, it was more of, more of like a catch-all. We're doing all of those things, but you also might be picking up a camera and shooting second camera. You know, you're developing the story in many other ways, you know, and, and I think the term that we use for producer really was born out of the specials and the short features and stuff that we talked about where there, there wasn't really a director per se. There was no director credit for those things. It was like, if you were the producer, you were the person running those things. So in, in a film, you know, the director might be looked at as sort of the person at the top of the creative hierarchy. The producer might be the person working on all of, all of the relationships outside of that. In the case of the films that I did, it was both. Right. So so I was the one trying to develop these relationships for the most part, doing the interviews and putting it together like that. 
I always refer to it as keeping the train on the tracks. That's, That's what right. I feel like the producer does. And when I produce, I'm keeping the train on the tracks and keeping it moving forward. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, I, I think in, in a lot of these things, producer and director could be interchangeable. I think too, in sports, we wear a lot of hats in comparison to traditional you know, film media. That's right. And it's probably a factor of budget right? Of resources. It's like, you know, if you have one person that can do all of those things, why pay two, right? <laughs> yep. That's how it's always been. While we're there though, with Once Brothers, AJ and I, uh, we love that documentary. One of our favorite 30 for 30s. We spoke about an emotional moment with the brother that you were able to capture with your camera when the mom broke down talking about how, uh, Croatian resident came to her and said, Drazen wasn't your son. He was, he was our son. There was a, a emotional moment there, kind of a rack focus to the brother in a very touching moment. And that was your camera. Talk about that moment. We spoke about it with Michael Talasian. Hats off to Mike for creating that moment, right? And, and his vision and ending in Drazen's mom's house, which was incredibly powerful. You know, I had this camera in my hand and I, I was thinking the entire time on the trip, a couple of things. Number one, being incredibly aware of what the A camera was shooting, right? So I, I'm not shooting the same thing. And if I am, I'm, you know, if if he's wide, I'm tight If he or vice versa. It's easy to sort of get buried behind the lens, right? Where you're shooting something and, and you're just more caught up in, in, in the action than what the camera is capturing. I think that's that's an easy thing to, to have happen. What happened with me in that moment is that, you know, I knew that Michael Winnick, our amazing DP, was shooting Drazen's mom's face as she was talking. And Drazen's brother was there translating. Luckily, there was enough time that the, enough emotion to go around that I could, you know, get a bunch of different shots. And and we were just sort of lucky that we were able to capture that moment. And, you know, Drazen's mom playing with the necklace that has Drazen's face on it, just trying to pick up all of these little nuanced shots that are packed with emotion. Right. And I, th I think I was probably in my mind at the time, just thinking, get everything, get everything. And, you know, in the edit room, that's where you realize, OK, we, we got something. I love your humility, but I, I'm a believer that you create your own luck. And I think for you learning how to shoot a camera, which you, you kind of glossed over is that you you were editor, but you also obviously taught yourself how to shoot. And then that having that skill and being there in that moment and being ready for it and, and capturing it. As Seth said, and Michael told us, it was just a, a really good moment in the film that just sort of jumped off at you as soon as you saw it. So well done. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I mean, honestly, like I said before, this was the first real film that I had worked on. And you know, I knew Mike had done films before. He was a film school guy at US, USC. And so I just wanted to be a sponge. Yeah, take it all in, right? Whatever I could. And I knew that every decision that he made was being made for a reason that maybe I couldn't even see at the time, but I was internalizing all of it, you know, and trying to think, why did he make that decision? You know, if I told him, hey, maybe, you know, he would always give me a chance at the end of an interview, you know, hey, did I miss anything? Which I do now to, to my producers. And I would say something and he would skip over it. And I would say, you know, wh why did he skip over that? Did he cover it somewhere else? So I, I was always trying to process these things and learn from him. And it was just, it was an incredible experience. That's awesome. Well done. Great instincts there. I think this is a perfect segue to get into act two, which is to dive into some of your great documentaries. And of course, with the Olympics going on right now, let's start with the Dream Team documentary. How did you get involved with the Dream Team documentary and talk a little bit about the hours of film you had to go through and some of the initial stages of that production? You know, we had had all of this footage for 20 years. I think I think it was the 20th anniversary, right? When it came out. Yeah. Yep, um, 2012, 2012. So Andy Thompson, very good friend of mine, who was also one of the executive producers on The Last Dance. He's been at the NBA forever. Brothers Michael Thompson, just the best guy. You know, he's another guy that forms these incredible relationships with players like Kobe Bryant. And he was on that trip with the Dream Team in 1992 in Barcelona and, and, and all the stops prior with his little camera filming all of that. It's funny. I'm watching the playoffs on TV now and I still see him in the background. <laughs> his camera. He loves his little cameos. He's like Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock of the NBA. <laughs> But he shot all of that footage. And so we had been sitting on it forever and I think trying to figure out what to do with it. 30 for 30, of course, happened. And all of a sudden, the sports doc was really a thing. The NBA was trying to do whatever it could to create this space for NBA TV where they had original content 
original documentaries. And so the dream team was a natural story to tell at the time, right? And based on my prior work on Once Brothers and the, the TV shows that I had mentioned, the association, I think I had sort of put myself in the position to direct that film. So it was a question of, yeah, how, what to do with all the footage, right? We knew that it was always going to be basketball porn, basically, right? Like this is the 11 of the greatest players of all time, all together. I mean, you're never going to get the, anything like this again. And we have the footage. And for any basketball or sports fan, we knew that it was just going to be incredible. So I think my job was to go through this footage and figure out where's the story, right? Because at the time, it was just being covered. It wasn't being covered at the time in 1992, like ultimately this will be a documentary and let me get... Let me dive into these interpersonal relationships and that kind of thing. So all of that had to be brought out in the edit room and, and with the writing. And Aaron Cohen, one of your guests, phenomenal person and writer. I love the plug. I love how you plug our, our, our listeners to go check that one out too. But go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, Aaron. Yeah. Aaron, Aaron's my guy. You know, it all came alive in the edit room. And, and so what kind of conflict can be generated um, and maybe generated is the wrong word because there's there's sort of the subtext that that it was created. It was it was real. What sort of tension could we show the viewers was actually there, right? And MJ is the new the new guy in town, right? And you have Bird and Magic, and here comes MJ. And so we were able to find these little moments that nobody even knew. I don't think they were logged, like MJ getting on the bus. And magic saying, you know, oh, keep walking or whatever, whatever he said. And you find a bunch of little nuggets like that. And all of a sudden you sort of have a story of this tension, right? Which, which was real. And so it was my job to sort of figure out how that plays into, into the story, where to put it. There wasn't a shortage of incredible footage for that film. Well, I want to know about the footage that you couldn't show. Because you you preceded the heat, uh, set the night at the heat, and we all have worked in an environment where there's stuff you can show and stuff you can't show. So I'm guessing there was plenty of footage in that in that vault that you were said, "Hey, you can't you can't use this." You know, I'm trying to remember. It was so long ago. I don't remember anything particular in that film um, because there was nothing really controversial. Like I, you know, maybe I was thinking maybe the gambling. I thought maybe there'd be some gambling stuff, and, yeah, and they wouldn't let you I show mean, that way. I mean, I feel like there was probably some of that that we didn't put in. I don't remember in particular, but there very well could have been. Yeah. But there was nothing like that would have made anybody think any differently about any of those guys. Larry Bird talks about drinking beer at the pool, you know, it's so, you know, it was what it was. Scotty Pippen on the, on the topless beach, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> no, that was funny too. You showed all that. The, the, the beer, the beer, the $7 beers was funny. That was a funny yeah. line. So the whole thing, that was, it was funny. Speaking of Michael Jordan, whether it's with this documentary or something else you've done within the NBA, what's your best Michael Jordan story? My best Michael Jordan story. I started in 97. AT, Andy Thompson, was already following the Bulls at that point. So I don't really have any personal MJ stories. I mean, with these guys, one thing that you find out early is that the stars always go last. The biggest stars always go last. Whether you're following a team or you're doing a shoot with several players, the big stars always go last. And so MJ, Bird, and Magic were the last three interviews. I think I did all the other ones, but we were making another film for ESPN at the time called The Announcement about Magic Johnson. And so I literally was editing the announcement while we were producing the Dream Team. So I didn't do those three uh, interviews. I, I, I had interviewed MJ for something else, and that was a really cool experience, obviously. When I was an intern for the Heat, I'd never been in an NBA locker room at the time before, right? And these guys were, you know, it was like being in front of the biggest superstars at the time. Um, Greek gods. Yeah, Greek gods, your 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 idols. And I remember the Knicks came and I, I went into the locker room and I saw Anthony Mason face to face and Patrick Ewing. I was like, holy shit. This is the coolest thing I've ever done. And my job was to get quotes for the PR team to to release to, to the press, right? So I had a little tape recorder and I would just, you know, stand in the scrum and record it. And I was just staring at these guys the whole time, like, oh my God, you're actually that big, right? <laughs> Six foot 10, seven feet. It was just incredible. And I remember the Bulls came to town 
and I walked into the locker room and I saw Michael Jordan in the locker room. I couldn't believe that I was standing in a locker room with Michael Jordan. It was one of the coolest things to have ever happened to me in my life. And I'm like, I get to go put a mic in his face. He probably hated it. <laughs> and then, you know, several years later doing a, a, an interview here or there with him, just a really nice guy. People don't expect that from a lot of these guys. You know, I was able to develop a relationship with LeBron and, you know, just the greatest guy. That was my MJ story right there. Just being so starstruck the first time I saw him. Now it's hard to to get me starstruck. (laughs) I tell you what, uh, going back to the Dream Team doc, the Monte Carlo footage of the practice, you know, the Stockton home video was great. The story about the select team coming in. There were so many great stories how did you weave? What was your goal there? Just to weave it by timeline, just naturally? Or did you take some other ideas and say, hey, I want to do it this way? Yeah, I mean, it was. I think it was always going to be pretty chronological, the story, going from the building of the team to, to what they were able to accomplish. And I think, you know, through that lens, you could get into the relationships that were formed and some of the more human aspects of the story. You know, I, I think that that was sort of a natural progression, both for the team and maybe the obvious route for the film, but one that we knew that would work. And look, I think, you know, for anybody listening that is just getting started in in filmmaking or storytelling, I've worked with people like this. I've worked for people like this who are very austere when it comes to sticking to the narrative that they think their story should be. It was a story of blah, 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 blah. Okay, now I'm going to edit it to show that. And that's obviously a very effective way to do things Uh, with certain stories. I never really bought too much into that. You know, I sort of come at it with a more, I guess, flexible approach where you go with your best stuff, right? And so for the dream team in particular, and this goes to everything that I think I've ever done to this day, what I'm working on, you go with your best stuff. So you do these interviews uh, in the dream team case with 12 superstar athletes and you probe as much as you can to try to maybe get a little nugget that nobody's ever heard or get into their you know the the more human side so when my wife sits down next to me and watches it she can relate to these people as well and then you take those sound bites and you say how can i build around this what footage do i have to really bring this to life as opposed to he didn't say exactly what I wanted him to say. So I'm just going to write something in the script that says that. And let me use this footage this way. And you're, you're really like sticking to sticking to the script. But I think doc filmmaking to me is, is not about that, right? It's about going wherever the story takes you and really trying to be able to have the eye and the ears for what will resonate. So in the case of the dream team, it's it's taking some of the most dramatic moments of these interviews and structuring it around that. Was there ever a thought to interview Isaiah Thomas? Yeah, we tried. We tried. He didn't want to. And I, I actually, see why. <laughs> yeah, he, did, he didn't want to at the time. I think that that's what it was. I remember he ended up making some sort of comment afterwards about it. I can't remember if it was Twitter at the time or something else, but he engaged with the film in that way. I happen to really like Isaiah working with him on bad boys. He was, he was amazing. And every time I saw him thereafter, I I love Isaiah. Great guy. And so, yeah, we talked a little bit about the dream team afterwards, uh, you know, during bad boys, I should say, but yeah, we tried, we tried. He wasn't interested at the time, I guess. 30th anniversary for the Dream Teams coming up. Is there anything that you are aware of? Any special uh, special films or things that we can we can look forward to? I, I don't know. I feel like I heard some talk about something maybe last year. I'm sort of of the mindset of like, we told that story. Yeah. Uh, but, but I also understand the hunger and the appetite for anything that has to do with those guys. It was really the golden era of basketball, right? So who wouldn't, wouldn't want to consume that content? I know I would if something comes out, but I certainly won't be making it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not a lost archive of footage sitting back in an NBA <laughs> room somewhere. I don't know, man. One, one of the early things I did at the NBA was literally know where every frame of footage was kept in that library. So if it does, you know, it was being hidden in somebody's <laughs> desk drawer, which is entirely possible. You never know. But, they, you know, they might come up with some gems. Who knows? I tell you what, Zach, one of the cool things about working on Beyond the Lens is going through different films and finding the ones that you may not have heard of or the ones that you hadn't 
dove deep into before. For me, it was the doctor. You know, you worked on the doctor. We all knew Dr. J's story. You know, I was familiar with it. But sitting down and watching that documentary, which I found on YouTube for our listeners, you can go check it out there. It was so much that I learned. And I felt like you took aspects that you learned as a producer on Once Brothers and applied it to the doctor. Is that accurate? And how so? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, I think from a more macro standpoint, I, I think I took things that I learned on everything that I've done and, and brought it there. You know, I, I look, it's funny, I look back now at all of these films and I say, man, I can't believe I made that decision. I would have done this, you know, and that's what experience is, right? That's what experience teaches us. At the time I had the experiences that I had and took that to the film. But I, I, I mentioned earlier, connecting with players, like like on a personal level. Really, it's connecting with people. My mother's a uh, therapist, right? So I grew up in a house where, you know, we were talking about everything. It was like, mm-hmm. hey, mom, stop. I don't want to talk about emotions anymore. <laughs> but here I am using that to my advantage. Every interview with every, um, you know, human connection, falling back on that. And so going into the doctor, Initially, I've, as, if I remember correctly, initially it was going to be a doc on the 83 Sixers, which won the championship. And then it morphed into a film on Dr. J. And I love Dr. J. Uh, I was a big fan. And I was thinking, at, you know, how can I make a story that will, you know, it's not just going to be like showing a bunch of Dr. J highlights that nobody's ever seen. Like, oh, this guy was the greatest dunker. All the stories that you've heard before mm-hmm. about the hair in the 70s and, you know, the Afro and being cool and, you know, which some of that did make it into the film. But what more could we bring to that story? What emerged was two sort of themes that I think I was able to bring out in, in the film, which number one was this notion of the best part of his career, nobody saw. Because he was playing in the ABA, there were no TV deals. You had to be lucky enough to be in the building to see this guy be a magician on the court. So it was this idea of a legend, right? What is a legend? What, is a le- what does the word legend mean? You know, it's, it's a term that's used on a daily basis by the NBA about their former players, right? Like everybody's a legend if, you, if you're a former player. But in this case, he truly was a legend because there were all of these incredible stories about him that were true, but nobody saw, except for those maybe 5,000 people at the time who were in the building, right? Or if you happen to be at the Rucker, you know, in Harlem watching him play. On the um, roof. Yeah, on, the, <laughs> on a roof, exactly. In the summertime, nobody knew about the doctor when he was really the doctor, right? So there was that. And then, you know, as I started talking to, to Julius and his nephew, Barry, who's a friend of mine, great guy, Barry Bookard, as I started talking to, to those guys, I realized that, Julius had like this insane amount of loss in his life, right? His mom died, his brother died when he was 19, then his dad died, or his dad died prior, then his mom died, then aunts and uncles, and then of course later on his son died. That is just an insane amount of loss for somebody to have gone through to lose your brother and your mother when you're very young, and then your son when you're an adult. It's hard to really even think about, right? And so I thought that Diving into that would really humanize him, right? Would build the legend of Dr. J and his resilience and, and he's still here, right? And and he was an open book, man. He was like totally with it. Those sort of two narratives emerged in a really unique and special way, I think. And so diving into that human aspect, I'm always trying to dig deeper. What are those pieces that everybody can relate to, mm-hmm. right? And so with him, he had all of these things in his life that you and I could relate to. We can't relate to, you know, jumping off the free throw line and dunking, dunking a ball, right? We can watch it and marvel at it, but we can all relate to these human elements, loss and, and, and that kind of thing. And, and so that's what emerged. What was the transition like going from doing an 83 Sixers documentary to then just doing The Doctor? Was it a conversation you had with Julius saying, hey, I think we want to make this all about you? How did that come about? Yeah, I, I wish I had a story there. I really don't. I, I, I think that it was prior to even being involved in any production. The 83 Sixers might have been kicked around because at the time it was the anniversary. And then I think it was just, you know, it was just decided that this was the better route to take. In telling Julius's story, we could also, you know, dive into that 83 team as well. And Moses Malone and, and some of the other players. But at the heart of it, you know, Julius was the guy, right? That yeah. he was going to, he would have dominated that film anyways. Cool. I'll ask you this then. We know Dr. J is Mr. Cool. What's the coolest story you have with Dr. J? 
coolest story I have. Best personal story. Taking Julius around New York to the places that were the most meaningful to him. Nassau Coliseum. There was a, there was a cool moment in the film where, where I take an old photo of Julius walking into the Nassau Coliseum. And I shoot him from the exact same angle now, right? In, in, yeah. In, you know, he's wearing a suit and dissolve into him walking in, you know, in that very 70s style. That was very cool. Yeah. And we did probably 20 takes of that. I can't imagine how annoying it is for the subject, uh, in this case, Julius, to be waiting between takes because after each take, I was going over to my cameraman and I was having him play the shot back to me. And I had on my phone the photo. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm having him freeze the frame and i'm like this has to be perfect right it can't be off at all and so we probably did 20 takes of that shot of him just walking by the coliseum and like looking back at the camera for a split second and i knew what i wanted to do and he was just so patient with me and that was our first stop i had done the interview with him down in atlanta already which was another cool story man yeah he he was just so cool about that and then going to his childhood home having him like stretch his arms across the room, like where he slept with his brother and he could touch both walls with his arms outstretched just to see where he came from to what he became was, was amazing. But somebody told me that he dunks, dunks a basketball every year on his birthday. And so I remember getting on a call with him before I had ever met him. And I said, I I have this idea, like, would you do a dunk for us? And he was like, sure, no problem. He's in his sixties. And I'm thinking like, I think at the time I was, I'm in my thirties. I'm like, my knees are hurting. (laughs) You know, I can I can barely walk from playing outdoors on the blacktop and he's ready to dunk and we did it. He rattled it in and I'm going to tell you a little secret here. Yeah, I was about to say I was that was part of my question because you didn't show the end of it. You didn't I'm show gonna, if it actually went in or not. I'm going to tell you a little secret. BTL so, moment, BTL moment. <laughs> it, it, the, the ball did go in. It did go in. He dunked it. He got his arm, you know, he got his hand over the rim and he threw it down but it hit the back iron. And it rattled in the rim a little bit. <laughs> so I said, can you do it one more time? And by the way, like Julius was was stretching beforehand. He was loosening himself up. He was shooting with his, with his son, trying to get his body, you know, right to dunk. And he threw it down, but it rattled ever so slightly. And I'm like, okay, this has to be the Julius, you know, that everybody expects, right? Mm-hmm. Will you do one more dunk? And he did another one and it was like a similar thing. And then I just saw like, Okay, I'm not going to ask you to dunk. Again, <laughs> you can't get right? 30 of these. Yeah, you wait, 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 we need to save you for next year so you can do it. You don't want Dr. So, J to blow his Achilles. <laughs> yeah, man, that was the last thing I wanted to happen. He was ready to try it again, but I think, you know, yeah. I was like, um, the way you caught it, it looks like he threw it down. So, I, it, yeah, yeah. It well, I'm both. saying he got up. I mean, you could see him jumping up and touching either side of the backboard in one of the shots. You know, he grabs the rim and he hangs on it with two hands. He gets up and he 1,000% dunked the ball. He just wasn't clean. Well, I'm so anal. I'm like, you know, <laughs> back iron, what am I going to do? So this is a great, a great little thing where sometimes your biggest problems become maybe your biggest opportunities, right? If I cut it and we, we cut to black and that's the end of the film – Right. The legend lives on. Mm-hmm. Right. What did he do? Yeah. He'll create some conversation. So if he would have if, if it would have been a different dunk or whatever that, you know, you very well, very well would have seen it. Or, you know, maybe I would have made the same decision. I'm not I'm not sure, but it worked out. And I guarantee you to this day, that was what, nine years ago. I guarantee you, Julius is still dunking. <laughs> he looks like he could still play. I, I guarantee you he is still dunking. Two amazing, amazing things. person. Two quick things for me on that. that. You hear the producer, I'm assuming it's you, ask him if he could still dunk. I, I'm guessing, was that in the car or something? And there was a scene there. It's like, hey, you can still dunk and when you guys are driving. you know. And I thought that was good to set that up. And then I can't let you off the hook without telling us what happened in your interview in Atlanta. So first of all, that was Andy Thompson, AT, in the car. Oh, okay. AT rode with Dr. J. I was at the gym setting up the crew for the interview. And then he arrived with, with Dr. J. I think when I was talking about the interview, I was thinking about the the dunk because that happened right after the interview. You know, he changed into his gym clothes and and did the dunk. It's funny. He, you know, Julius can talk. I'm told one of his nicknames is sundown because when he gets on the golf course, you're not leaving until until the sun is down. That'd be cool. I remember being about five hours into the interview and still having so much to cover. 
and being like, man, he's he's going to be totally worn out. But he was such an incredible sport and just talked and talked and gave it all up. I can't say enough good things about him. And there were some emotional moments there too, though, right? Because he, he was crying. He just brought out, I mean, talking about his brother having lupus. There were so many things that just brought out a lot of emotions. Knowing how much loss he had been through, I, I kind of, you know, I kind of thought, and I used to get teased for this, like making people cry when I interviewed them, right? Like Rick Mahorn and Bad Boys, you know, who would have ever, who would ever expect Rick Mahorn to cry in an interview? And I thought that, you know, I would really be able to get through with Julius on some of this stuff. And it was his brother where he got emotional. I think he was a freshman in college at the time, freshman or sophomore, and obviously still a very emotional subject for him. You know, you can imagine losing a a sibling at that age has to be devastating in every way. And so, yeah, so talking about him definitely brought those feelings right to the surface. Chuck D was silky smooth as a narrator. Any cool stories working with Chuck D? Everything about Chuck is cool. And Chuck is from Roosevelt, Long Island, which is where Julius is from. So the connection was just perfect on every level. I mean, I was a huge Public Enemy fan. And so when it became a possibility of getting Chuck, actually, the first time I talked to him over the phone, that was like that moment that I was in the locker room with Michael Jordan, right? Because he was like an idol at the time, you know, and that's also a really funny thing. When, when you talk about idolizing some of these guys, like from, from your childhood, you forget that these guys are like in their early twenties at the time. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> no. so when you finally get face to face, you're like, Oh, you're only eight years older than me. <laughs> it's like a surreal moment where like time is so it's, it's, it's weird like that. Um, it is. I flew out to, uh, to California to have Chuck narrate the film. And first of all, this guy's basketball knowledge, he made me look stupid. Like, I feel like I know a lot about basketball history and he knows everything. And so we were talking about every player and who was in the finals this year and that year and what happened. And he's just a huge Julius fan. And so he was so happy to do this. And it was just so cool. Like he was in the booth and he's asking me how I want him to deliver these lines. I'm like, Chuck, like you're, you're an artist. Like <laughs> Whatever you say is going to be great, but obviously you got to get the right inflection on certain things. And so he, he was amazing with that. And here's the coolest thing about that experience and about Chuck. After I left, because I I actually had a plane to catch, I would have missed it if I didn't get what I needed. I knew I got what I needed. So I had spent probably four hours with him narrating the whole film, right? And he asked me to leave the script with him. And after I left, he redid everything. (laughs) Wow. By the time I got back to New York, I had two versions of the film. I had the version of me directing Chuck and then him going through it. Like he's such a perfectionist. He wanted to nail it. He wanted it. Like he was so invested in the project and in Julius. And that was the first and only time anything like that has ever happened. Chuck was, was just, man, unbelievable. Well, that gives me a natural segue into your next doc, which was Bad Boys. But I wanted to ask about the VO with Kid Rock. You were talking about VOs and working with artists like Chuck D. What was it like to work with Kid Rock on Bad Boys? Interesting. (laughs) (laughs) it was interesting now look this was pre-trump right this was pre-kid rock becoming involved in any way in politics i wanted somebody to narrate the film that was going to elicit some emotional response whether you love him or hate him and kid rock obviously is a detroit guy so i thought he was the perfect choice he said you can come to my house my private recording studio (laughs) to record. We stopped. We got a bottle of whiskey for him, an expensive bottle of whiskey. I figured that, you know, he would like the whiskey. (laughs) Went to his house. He's got a camouflage pickup truck, like all the way backwoods, Michigan, crazy dirt road. You know, first of all, Kid Rock was cool enough to say, yes, I'll do it. So anybody that gives their time and we weren't, we weren't paying these guys. Damn, really? Yeah. So any anybody that is willing, I just to assume donate, that's how you got both of them. Yeah. No. I mean, I think we made may have made a donation to a charity or something of their choice. Yeah. So I go to his home studio and he's actually recording. I think he had an album coming out or something. So insanely beautiful studio right on his property. We go into the side area where we're going to be recording him, and he comes in. Very little pleasantries. He introduces himself. Nice guy. Goes right into the booth. Grabs the script and starts reading. Now, one thing that I've learned when I do these films, if you have an open, right, like a show open, that's usually like, it feels like a like a promo or a teaser a lot of times, right? And this was sort of the style that I was doing these things in at the time. I, I don't know that I would do it the same way now. 
um, having a show open per se like that. But at the time I did, those are always the parts of the film that sort of need to be read a, a very particular way, mm-hmm. you know, and the, and, the, and the narrator really needs to be warmed up. They need to have read a lot of the script or sometimes the whole script, sort of get in the vibe, the headspace of what the voice is, that kind of thing. Having taken direction throughout the script, right? Then you go back to the open and you do it. So oftentimes I'll start with the open, then I'll do the whole script and then I'll go back to the open. So he's reading the open and it's just, you know, it's sort of very fast and I'm hitting the button, uh, kid, kid, kid rock, or you know, Mr. Rock, can we do, can we do this line again? I think after the third time I did it, he was like, look, I'm going to do this shit however I want to do it. And you're either going to take it or you're going to leave it. And this is like maybe the third line of the entire film. <laughs> um, and now look, I, again, I will say in his defense, I was encroaching on his time, right? It, it, he was recording his album. So I was there on his time, you know, his business, you know, putting out a new album, which is his, his passion, obviously. And he's taking the time out to do this as a favor. And I'll say, normally when we're working with normal VO artists, we could tell them to do whatever we want them to do. Right. <laughs> this isn't Kid Rock. This isn't right. Fussy. This right. isn't. He, he is very much Kid Rock. Because yeah. you're paying him. He you're paying him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So all those things were factored in, but at the same time, I'm somebody that I, I'm you're, very. You're anal. I'm you're like, anal. I know in my head. I I know exactly how it should sound in my head. I know you can do it if you just let me say, "Hey, can you say this one word like this?" And he was like, "No, nah, we're not doing that." So I remember in that moment sort of freaking out and firing off a message like we might have to abort. Like I I thought that there was a possibility that he was just going to go up and walk out. But to his credit, he didn't. And he warmed up as we went. He ended up doing an incredible job, but we didn't have a chance to go back and redo the open. And so every time I see Bad Boys, if it's on NBA TV or ESPN and I see the open, I'm like, shit. Those first two lines bother the hell out of me. Like I wanted to, <laughs> and only you and now our listeners know that nobody else caught on to that. And and of course I'm thinking everybody knows this. Like the, those first two lines just do not sound right. But man, he did a great job, and that was a fun fun experience. It wasn't like the doctor when you got back and and Chuck had sent you a whole nother set of scripts. You didn't get that experience. Not so much. Not so much. <laughs> Again, I can't complain because, you know, he agreed to do it and he did it. So no doubt. Uh, yeah, that was that was fun, though. Another BTL moment right there. Another BTL moment. 2014, I was at the Emmys that year and the doctor won the Emmy for long form documentary and i remember dr j was there what was that moment like for you and talk to us about that night and what it was like unbelievable the it was the culmination of all of those years of putting in those insane hours sleeping in the edit room or pulling all-nighters working to get myself to the point where i could be trusted to to run these films and these shows and honing my craft, I guess. Yeah, that was the culmination of all of those things. And and I was just so happy for Julius because he was so invested in the film and giving his time and his energy, his emotion and trusting me. Like who, who was I at that time? For a big part of my career, that's been a blessing, you know, being able to gain the trust of a lot of these people when they might not know who I, who I am or who I was or what I've done. And Julius trusted that I was going to take care of him, I guess, to, to, to tell this story the right way. So to see him up on that stage, you know, I don't remember who we were up against, but I remember the year before both the dream team and the announcement, the other film that I did, both those films were nominated for best documentary in the same year. We had a 40% chance of winning the Emmy the year before (laughs) and we lost. And so I remember talking to some people there saying, man, I, I thought we had such a great chance last year. Dion Kokoros from the NBA, who who went up and accepted the award, he was the EP, went up and accepted the award with Julius, kept saying to me before, no, nah, Julius is here. He's here. He's in the building. They got to give it to us. <laughs> and I was just, I was totally skeptical. When they said the doctor, I, I, I remember letting out like a, a scream, like, yes. It was exhilarating. It was so cool walking around with him holding the trophy that night. It was just, you know, an incredible, incredible memory. That's cool. Any drinks after or... Where's the Mandarin in, in 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 New York City in Columbus Circle? That building or right next door? Yeah, um, that's where they hold the sports Emmys every year. And there was a restaurant or a bar in there, and I I can't remember what it was called, but we all went in there. 
Julius came in, took a bunch of pictures with everybody. It was a great moment. And I think the next day we were like, okay, what's the next one? (laughs) Well, well deserved. That was one of those documentaries, like I told you. I had not watched it, but when I watched it, I was like, man, this is really, really, really well done. And so I'll transition to your your Bad Boys documentary. We won't go deep here, but I... I'll tell you my Michael Jordan story. So the Heat are playing the Hornets in the playoffs. Must have been 2012, 13. It was a purple shirt guy when D-Wade was torching a purple shirt guy. And so anyway, we're in a restaurant and I look down and I see the Bad Boys documentary on. And so I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I've seen it a couple of times. But I look underneath the TV and Michael Jordan's sitting there and he's watching the Bad Boy documentary. Oh, that's and cool. What I would not have given to hear. His his story on the backside of, hey, how he saw that moment with the Pistons. What was the experience like for you working on the Bad Boys documentary? It was amazing. And I'm going to take you back, actually, to when I did the interview with Scottie Pippen for the Dream Team. And again, you know, you never know what's going to end up in a film, right? So, so I'm sitting with these players and I'm saying, I have this time with them. Let me just probe, probe, probe. So I asked him a bunch of stuff about, you know, his relationship with MJ and, you know, being a rookie, growing up in Arkansas, that kind of thing. And then, of course, I asked him about the Pistons. You'll remember in, in the Dream Team, his comments were in were in the film about, mm-hmm. about the good. Pistons and how much he hated them. So I knew that it was more than a rivalry. Like, there was a genuine hatred there amongst these guys that ran deep. The goal is always to tap into those things, right, to that emotion. And that was there. And so for the bad boys, you know, the key is, again, the stars, right? The key is going to be Isaiah and Bill Lambeer. You know, this unlikely relationship is going to form the backbone of of the team and and also the film. And so I did pre-interviews with those guys in in the city, in the NBA offices, just shooting the shit with them, talking about stuff, trying to dig into what made them tick. So I remember Bill Lambeer walks in and he says, so let me understand this. This is the interview before the interview? And I said, yeah, he's like this is so stupid. (laughs) I love this guy. This is going to be amazing. It was an amazing experience because these guys had not gotten their due. They were glossed over in all of the storytelling around the golden era of basketball, right? They were just skipped over. And so to be able to, to talk to those guys and get to know some of them and spend time with them and get into their stories was really cool. And, And a lot of them, I'll tell you, Mark Aguirre, for example, I had never met Mark. You know, I had done stuff with Isaiah, maybe Lambeer, Rodman before. And you know what you're getting with those guys, right? Mark Aguirre was a guy that I I knew nothing about. I mean, I knew his basketball career. I knew nothing about him as a person. Coolest guy, man. And he sits down in his chair. And I remember like shortly into the interview, asking him about Adrian Dantley. What, when he to just, <laughs> exactly. I was like, okay, you're going to have a bigger role in this than I thought you were. It, another example of like, you go with your best stuff, right? You know, Mark was just a guy that was not afraid to speak his mind. You know? I love that part of the doc because you didn't expect it. It was getting closer to the end well you know you're at a point where you're like okay there i know something's about that they're about to win but you know then you have this friction between them i'm like oh man and then you can feel it like ad still don't like those dudes so i'm like this is crazy (laughs) no for the ad interview that was down in dc he walked in and he sat in the chair he was saying what's this about again like the bad boys and i was you know telling him about the film and he just started talking like he the animosity was right there at the surface right there (laughs) I don't even remember how many questions I asked him. You know, he, he, he just, he was happy to be able to get a lot of that stuff off his chest. And I think a lot of those guys were, the timing was right. That's why so, so many of these sports docs are great because so much time has passed. Mm-hmm. And when you're in the moment, you no know, athletes are not going to really dive into these things and explore them, whether it's emotionally or in necessarily an honest way when they're answering questions in a locker room as they will 20 years later when they're looking back on it, right? And so the timing was just perfect for that story and for everybody to just give it up. Definitely something we've talked about on the show before, letting moments breathe so people can reflect properly on those moments. And they don't have Zach Levitt in the heat locker room sticking the mic in their face so they could just, you know, it's not the same. That's right. That's exactly. right. All right, we're going to get into Act 3. A couple quick hitters and talk about what you have going on right now. Quick hitters, so you don't, you don't have to deep dive. Opinion on athlete-produced documentaries. I don't know that I've given that enough thought it's a it's an interesting question i think all the more power to them right it's their story to tell so why should they necessarily rely on somebody else to take 
whatever narrative they have in their head and create something different. I think any athlete that is producing a documentary that is willing to be 100% honest about themselves is going to create a great documentary, right? I, I think that if you're only interested in creating a hagiography and building on your brand, so to speak, I think the audience can see through that. But I think if you're willing to really tell the truth and show the warts in your life and maybe some mistakes and talk about them, I think that people will love you even more. And so any athletes that are willing to do that, I think are doing the right thing. And of course, if they're producing their own story, it, it makes the most sense for them to do that if they're willing to really tell the story in a way that that, that people can engage with. That's the key, right? Being honest yeah. about it. I'm going to take you back to the, to the Bad Boys doc real quick. Choosing the warehouse. Why'd you make that decision? First of all, I wanted something that would make the interviews visually arresting, that would look artistic, but also conveyed this idea of a couple of things, like a, a sort of a forgotten time, forgotten era, and also just gritty and grimy, right? And I remember going to, it was actually a PA who lived in Patterson, New Jersey, told me about this place. It was this 500,000 square foot factory that was uh, built in 1840, mm -hmm. and they used to make rope for the Civil War, for the boats uh, to be used during the Civil War era. And there were all these incredible rooms. Um, and I went and saw it. I went and scouted it with my DP. And I, I'll never forget, man, we went in about two or three different rooms. And every room was more insane than the next. And my DP told me, he looks at me and he says, when I die, bury my ashes here. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we're going to literally be able to drop the camera anywhere in this place and have an insane shot. It was good from a budget perspective, flying the players in as opposed to flying four crew members around the country for all these interviews. So we were able to fly them in, put them up in a hotel. And then I found a place just like that in Detroit for the rest of the interviews. Uh, I thought so, the whole thing was in Detroit. So you tricked me. I was like, yeah. oh, this is cool. He got a building in Detroit. Like you totally tricked me. Most of them were in, in, uh, in New Jersey. That's crazy that those are in New Jersey because I think everyone thought those were in Detroit because <laughs> Detroit, obviously being on hard times in the city, having blown out buildings and closed down storefronts, it looked like it was in Detroit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Dirty little secret. And I'm not telling, uh, I'm not going to say, say the name of the place because it's too special. <laughs> I don't want everybody shooting there. No. The art factory. <laughs> Great place. As an editor, your go-to late night editing snack coffee that's my go-to late night editing snack and if i'm somewhere with a vending machine probably a granola bar i can drink an extra large dunkin donuts coffee in the morning and fall asleep 15 minutes later <laughs> but if i drink a small coffee at 10 p.m i'm up the entire night and i always keep a lot of gum and mints in the in the edit room i probably go through a pack of gum a night if I'm if I'm pulling a late one. Seminal moment in your career so far. One of them would probably be that night that we won the Emmy. Mm -hmm. I think with, with Dr. J. There was a sense that we were doing something right and that personally it was really gratifying in every way. I think the stuff that I'm doing now, which I know we can touch on, is maybe the most fulfilling. Talk about what you have going on right now. You've made the transition into the podcast world. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so I got hired to to start uh, a division for a company called Cadence Thirteen, which is a, a big podcast company. To start this division called C Thirteen Originals to create our own original content. And it's funny because I, I got hired after they asked me to do a, a podcast documentary on Big Poppy, which I did. And initially, that was going to be a look at the two thousand three American League Championship. I really wanted to do something like a little deeper with Big Poppy you know, touch on race in Boston and his life in the Dominican Republic and that kind of thing. And so I had this opportunity to like tell the story that I really wanted to tell. And they ended up bringing me on afterwards and I got to choose what stories we do. So to have that type of agency over the storytelling is really cool. And, and since then, none of them are in sports. You know, my first one was a really big one. It was called Root of Evil. It was about the Black Dahlia murder in Los Angeles. Uh, and it was told through the eyes of the family of the prime suspect. And they have an insane history of family trauma. So I'm really drawn to these human stories, right? These family stories. Um, just did one about 
woman who grew up in the witness protection program and her father was in the hell's angels and had murdered some people. And so she grew up in the witness protection program. And what I love is giving a voice to these people that would not ordinarily be able to share their stories and creating something really dramatic out of them. And we're on the third season now of a podcast called Gangster Capitalism. The first season was on the college admission scandal, which we were lucky enough to get a Peabody nomination for that. And then the second season was on the NRA, really focusing on the financial misdealing. But we're in the middle of the third season. It's about to end. And that's on Jerry Falwell junior and liberty university so really diving into the stories there and hearing from the people who've been most affected and giving them a voice i think right now is the most fulfilling thing that i've ever done and uncovering the things that have been done to to harm so many people whether you're talking about sexual assault sexual abuse or you know all of the other areas in which these people have been harmed the the, in this case, the Liberty students, faculty, staff, et cetera. So giving a voice to these people has been super fulfilling and doing these stories that are so disparate and so far from sports is really cool too. So when our listeners are done listening to this pod, where can they find the, that pod? Thanks for asking. Anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Odyssey, start with Root of Evil, go to Relative Unknown and go to Gangster Capitalism. I'll say you'll be uh, occupied for a while. I will say that Root of Evil is incredibly dark. It's a really dark, messed up story. So the um, bad boys don't have anything on that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. You know, cutting a cutting a body in half and posing it <laughs> at art is definitely a little darker than, than 80s NBA basketball. <laughs> we don't want to end this podcast on a dark note, but I think we've taken enough of your time. We really appreciate it, Zach, and we will be tuning in. But thank you again. This has been a great conversation. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you guys for asking me to be a part of it. Thank you. Special thanks to Zach for giving us all those exclusives. And make sure to check out his podcast, Gangster Capitalism, a must listen. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you do, we'll give you a big shout out. If you like what you heard, please share with your friends. We'll be back next week with another great episode of Beyond the Lens. And that's a wrap. And I'd like to give a special thanks to our editors, Jacob Gornberg and Andrew Holman and our production assistant, Candace Evans.